little bit. Okay. Uh, you can introduce. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. So, welcome to today's tech talk. It is um, two seventeen, Thursday, February seventeenth, and we have Kathleen here from AI Club at Hack MIT, and today she will be giving you guys a tech talk. Um, this will also be live streamed on YouTube if you want to tell your friends to tune in. And so you can take it away, Kathleen. Thanks so much, Vivian. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at Blueprint. And I'm so excited to see there are so many participants interested in AI because I know you guys are about to do a hackathon and this could be a really fun tool for you guys to think about incorporating in one of your projects. Here at MIT, I helped found and now currently run a project incubator that focuses on using AI in fun products, whether that's a web-based application or a mobile app or something else entirely. Um, we've had now fo four cohorts of students go through our club and produce really cool projects using AI. So today my goal is to tell you about what AI is. It's a very fast growing field um, and discuss with you sort of the state of AI. How are we using it today? What are some issues with it today? And finally, I'll tell you about AI at MIT, the club that I run, and the type of projects that we've made. And hopefully that can be inspiring to you guys, both for this hackathon and for when you go out in the world afterwards. So without further ado, I will share some slides. Okay. Um, okay, I think you can all see my slides now. If not, someone speak up. Um, so let's get started. Um, as I said, my talk overview um, is going to start off with what is AI, then go on to some applications and issues with AI today. And finally, we're gonna talk about um, the projects that we do at AI at MIT. And at the very end, I'd love to have a Q&A with you guys, but feel free to pop questions in the chat throughout so I can see them after. All right, so what is AI? I feel like every single day we hear about it, but maybe we don't have a great definition. Um, to start off, AI stands for artificial intelligence. So maybe we can break that down a bit and we can just look at the components. Um, first, intelligence. We probably talk about that a lot given that you're high school students and given that you're people ambitious enough to do a hackathon on the weekend. Um, so what do you think intelligence is? I guess if you're a student, sometimes that's measured with tests. So the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills is one definition. Um, but yeah, is it a test? Is it something that you can measure through something like an SAT or even an essay question? Where does something like creativity fall into that definition? How would you measure something like that? And if the definition that I pulled here from Google is the ability to apply knowledge and skills is something like a plant intelligent, um, it's able to collect information about its environment. It's able to change its growth patterns depending on where the sunlight is falling. But I don't think many of us would think of plants as having the kind of intelligence that we have or that animals have, or that if you know what AI is, that AI has. So yeah, what is intelligence? I think that's a question that a lot of neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, psychologists, all sorts of people interested in the human mind are still trying to answer. But with the sort of definition that maybe it's just a, the ability to acquire and apply knowledge, what is artificial intelligence? We could say that we take the definition of intelligence and it's anything that is demonstrated by machines. A more formal definition pulled from one of the most famous textbooks in AI is that AI is any system that perceives its environment and takes actions that maximizes its chance, sorry, typo, of achieving its goals. So that's kind of a wordy definition, but I think it does make sense. Um, in that way, like a plant kind of falls into this definition of AI and a lot of the AI we use today, as simple as it is, also falls into that. A very similar definition is perhaps AI is a system that can execute functions or perform tasks that in the past had required human knowledge. There's this phenomenon in AI where once we have something that works really well, um, once we've implemented an AI system that works really well, after some time goes on, people no longer view it as AI because it's viewed as a sort of simple technology. Um, 
So, but if we remember this definition, that it's any system that may in the past have required human intelligence that keeps the umbrella of AI quite wide. Um, and my definition in my head is honestly just computers doing useful stuff. Like it's a very, very broad field. And uh, I think since the beginning of AI till now, there are probably a million different ways that AI has been used and types of AI that have come about. So I guess you can keep it as simple as you want. And for me, that's computers doing useful stuff. But yeah, the field is growing super fast. And given that we're both still uncovering what it means to be intelligent as a human, and the field of AI is still growing to understand what artificial intelligence can be, I think that all these definitions will continue growing too. So let's move on to some applications of AI in daily life. I'm just gonna throw some images up and I hope that some of these look familiar to some of you. Maybe this Alexa or Siri, or maybe Google Translate if you're taking a language class and you weren't super great at it like myself. Um, this is a very low quality screenshot, but maybe something like Notability if you take notes on an iPad. Maybe Google Search, which I know I use every day or TikTok, which I also almost use every day, or Snapchat, or Face ID, or a Tesla, if you're special. Um, so all of these things are applications of AI that you might have interacted with today or very recently. Um, they're all things that use some kind of algorithm that aims to be intelligent. So let's go through some of them a little more closely. Um, in the example of the Alexa or Siri, those are personal assistants. And there's a few different things going on there. There's the processing of commands you give it. That might be something that falls into this idea of natural language processing. There's trying to pull the important um, information that it finds on the web or in your phone and distill that well into information it can present you. A lot of information processing there, a lot of AI there. Google Translate is another sort of branch of natural language processing. and it's gotten better and better over the years. You might've used it if you ever have um, the app to actually just take a picture of a foreign language document and it will return information to you there. So then it's combining natural language processing with something like computer vision, which brings us to our next thing, which is that handwriting recognition. Um, so handwriting recognition is one of the earliest forms of AI. It's finding patterns in the way letters take shape and identifying from handwritten text, uh, what character each section of the text is. Um, and that's been very helpful um, for form processing. Um, one of the early applications was actually just processing tax forms. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that's something that you might all have encountered in one of your notes apps. I know I love this feature. Uh, Google search, similar to the thing I mentioned with Siri and Alexa, you know, that's processing so much information to give you useful results. It's not just doing that through, I don't know what the other option is. It's doing it through AI. It's doing it through a really intelligent set of algorithms. Um, TikTok, Snapchat, other social media, you might have seen really interesting content on there today. And how is that given to you? Recommendation systems. Um, systems that take your data over time and look for trends to give you smart recommendations. It's how I stay super addicted to TikTok. But also on Snapchat, we have some image uh, processing, some computer vision, um, and you can see that with the filters. That's one of my favorite applications of AI is anything that uses images and manipulates images. I think that's super fun. Um, Face ID is very similar there. Again, some more computer vision. And Tesla is another example of computer vision, using that to navigate something as complex as the road. So yeah, that's kind of just a lot of different things that you probably have interacted with, and maybe you didn't know it was AI, or maybe you did, and you know it just becomes so normal now that um, it's not viewed as something super, super intelligent. But there were times when, when these things came out, it was like, you know, groundbreaking. Um, today, what's on the frontier is super exciting. Oops, skip a slide. Um, things like robotics and in manufacturing are evolving really fast and making our ability to do things like, um, I've seen really exciting work in robots for surgery or robots for firefighting. Um, those kinds of things are going to really transform our world. Same with manufacturing. And for me, the, my favorite applications of AI on the frontier today are in medicine and science. 
Um, so here you might see some screenshots from some news clippings. Um, one paper or result that came out just yesterday was from this group called DeepMind, one of the frontier AI research organizations in the world. And DeepMind managed to have really interesting results using AI to control plasma inside a fusion reactor. So fusion is one of the really exciting energy advancements that we hope to see in the next couple of years to help create sustainable energy. And um, this is the first time that I've seen really high profile work using AI to advance that science. Um, and then the second screenshot here is using AI to create personalized cancer screening. So um, AI has really revolutionized medicine. It's helped us find drugs faster. It's helped us create these more personalized approaches and understand how our genes relate to our health. So yeah, AI is definitely transforming so many different sectors of the world. If you don't think of yourself as someone who wants to work in you know, purely AI, whatever field you're interested in may eventually get impacted by AI. And that's one reason to pay attention to it or learn to use it as a tool. Um, I'll give an example. I'm actually a neuroscientist or that's what I aspire to be. And AI is actually transforming things a lot there too. Um, both in a scientific way and in a way that um, a lot of artificial intelligence researchers are interested in the brain. So there's some interplay there, but yeah, um, definitely whatever you're interested in, Google that word and then AI, and I'm sure you'll see some really interesting work come about. All right, so next, moving into some issues in AI. So uh, one issue is the environmental footprint. I'm sure we're all very environmentally conscious and one thing that we should definitely keep in mind is that just like any other technology, AI has a carbon footprint. And it's something that we should keep in mind. There's a ton of research being done to improve this carbon footprint and help reduce the amount of carbon that is being released as we train and deploy AI systems. Um, but this is an ongoing problem and something that I hope to see improved and be talked about more as we advance AI. Another issue is bias in AI. So basically you can imagine if an AI system is trained using the real world and there's problems in the real world, sometimes those problems will be reappearing or even amplified in the system. And that's really terrible. Um, one thing that we all expect from sort of technology is that it can treat people fairly and that it can make really accurate decisions. Um, and it's very scary to consider that AI may be making accurate decisions, but those decisions are unfair or biased, or that those decisions may be treated as more trustworthy because it's coming from a machine, a smart machine, um, and worsening sort of existing problems. So there's a lot of research being done into what problems exist in this domain in AI. And then once we identify those problems, solving them. So um, one a really exciting researcher at MIT named Joy Bulamwini was working with facial analysis software and was one of the frontier researchers in identifying that facial analysis software works very poorly on groups that have been historically underrepresented. For example, people with darker skin, women, um, and that's because those faces weren't really included well in the training data sets that create these models. Um, and so she pointed out this really important problem and is helping reduce the use of these sort of imperfect technologies in government. For example, recently the IRS, the, in, um, the group that processes our taxes, um, decided not to use the facial recognition software that it was considering because as Joy pointed out, it would not work equally across all the people trying to use it. Um, so I think her work is really important. Um, while it would be amazing to have AI in more parts of our lives, we need to make sure that it is fair and it is really, really well functioning um, before we introduce it uh, in ways that can affect people. Okay, so lastly, um, I'm going to talk about some projects that we do in the club at MIT called AI at MIT. Um, one thing I'd wanna note is a resource for you guys as you go into your hackathon, which I've put on the right here. It's a screenshot of this resource called ML5. I'll just say it again, because I realize the text actually is really small. Um, ML5, 
and you can just Google it and it should come up. Um, it is a JavaScript library that has, I think probably a dozen or two dozen different uh, trained machine learning tools. So um, I found this really helpful when I was getting started for just quickly getting to try out some uh, model I'm interested in, for example, something that does image classification or body segmentation or text sentiment analysis. If any of those don't sound familiar, don't worry. They have explanations for them when you click on them on their page. Um, and so I'll be showing you a project right now that I made using ML5. Um, but more generally at uh, AI at MIT, students have made projects spanning all kinds of um, subfields. We've had people make um, yes, I will send a link at the end of the talk. Thank you for the question. Um, so people have made things spanning like Spotify, shared playlist recommendation systems to um, video style transformation systems um, to stock trading systems to automatic map making systems. So really there's been a huge, huge number of cool projects that don't necessarily use ML5. Um, but often ML5 has been really, really helpful. So I'll be showing you a project with that. And that project is called PoseNet Body Art. If you have a more creative name at the end, please suggest it for me. Still struggling with a name for it. Um, but basically I was inspired by Snapchat filters. And I thought to myself, you know, what are the components of Snapchat filters? There's an AI part that's identifying a face or a body part. There is an artistic part that is adding an effect to a given part of the face or body. And perhaps there's some component um, of interaction because it's not just a photo that's still that you're adding the um, motion to. Often you can play the Snapchat filter before you even take your photo or video. You can move around and it will react to that motion too. So in the end, I partnered up with two other students and we made this project that combines your body's movements with PoseNet to create an interactive visual and auditory artistic experience. Um, so let's dive into what that looks like. And then I'll actually demo the project at the end. Um, so uh, here's kind of our tech stack or like how we decided to put everything together. PoseNet Art um, is an interactive web app where the user's motion activates real-time animations and sounds over their video feed. So we start with the video feed. Here you have an example of a person maybe using their webcam to record their motion. Next, we have PoseNet. PoseNet is a trained model that knows how to identify body parts. So here you see kind of a stick figure with little dots. You can imagine what that is, is it's PoseNet's output. It's PoseNet saying, okay, this dot is a neck, this dot is a hand, this dot is an elbow. And the lines connecting them are, you know, the, the pieces of the body connecting those sort of key points. Um, and PoseNet was trained through a um, way that a lot of other sort of image recognition systems are trained, it was given tons and tons of examples labeled meticulously with what each part of a body is. And then it was put through a learning algorithm that give it rewards if it predicted correctly where those body parts are. Um, so in the end, it knows how to do that. Um, and so, we were able to take the output from PoseNet and combine it with artistic effects from this thing called P5. Um, P5 is a library that you can use to add a lot of cool visual effects to your web page. Um, so we use that to create our own sort of Snapchat filter, our own sort of effects. And lastly, we also integrated some sounds. I think some Snapchat filters have sounds. So this was kind of also inspired by that. Um, and it's called tone.js. So in the end, I think we are only using really four tools. One is sort of the native video feed tool inside of a browser. Um, the other three I've just mentioned here in a bit more detail, PoseNet being the model, and we got that through the library I mentioned, ML5, uh, P5 for the sort of visual effects, and Tone.js for the sounds. All right, so just a bit more on PoseNet because this is an AI talk. Um, so PoseNet is a model for real-time human pose estimation. You can see here the kind of thing I was describing where this may be um, 
an output from PoseNet where you have someone moving around and it's able to identify, oh, look, there's an elbow. Oh, look, there's a hand. And you know, it's able to just draw lines between them to calculate um, what, the, what the body parts look like. You can imagine if you were to curl up into a ball or maybe if you were someone with an unusual um, like dimension to part of your body, like maybe you have really, really, really long arms, like such that your, your um, wrists are near the floor, maybe PoseNet would break. And so that's kind of a overall um, silly example, but it's just to prove the point that, you know, these are not um, intelligent systems in the way that you and I are, maybe that it can completely know that something is, is different or wrong. It has to kind of just react from what it knows and all it knows is body parts in the way it's been trained. So um, this will come up again later when I demo it. But um, one thing is if I stand too close to the camera, even if I raise up my hand, which you all know is a hand, PoseNet will actually be pretty confused by that because it really only knows what a hand is in the context of the rest of the body. So I'll show you when I demo the product that when I back up, suddenly it'll pick up my hand. But if I'm too close, it won't, it won't know. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's not intelligent the way we are. It's, it's just the product of its training. And, and that's something really important that, you know, goes back to what I mentioned about bias. Like we have a lot of work to do on AI before it's, it's really intelligent. Um, but okay, more on the project. Um, so here's how uh, we use PoseNet. Again, we take the live video feed, we pass it through PoseNet and it gives us the key points. So here's actually the list of key points that it creates. It gives us a nose, the eyes, the ears. So that's really useful for sort of localizing where the head is. It gives us a shoulder, elbow, and wrist for each side. So that's helpful for kind of finding where the arms are and the uh, shoulders sort of mark the beginning of the, the torso. It also gives us the hips and the knees and the ankles. So um, one thing you might notice is it doesn't have hand or fingers. So we found that was actually a challenge um, because if you have your hand here, maybe you could say, okay, hands are just an extension of the line between an elbow and a wrist. But if I were to drop my hand like this, suddenly it's in a completely new spot. Basically, we, um, we actually found that was a sort of interesting problem to try to predict where hands were. Um, okay. I'm just checking the chat really quick. Okay, so uh, anonymous attendee asking, what do the different colors represent? It's just sort of a visualization here in the sense that um, I think someone chose the different colors to make the animation look nice, but you, you know, um, you can imagine that you could change the colors however you wanted. You could set that, okay, all the leg related parts are red, all the head related parts are blue. I don't think the colors have any deep significance here. Um, another question from John. Yes, that is entirely correct. ML5 is an ML implementation library for web-based projects. And it's super cool because it runs client side, meaning it does not require that you host any kind of um, ML architecture. So the JavaScript library would be, it's pre-trained, all the models there are pre-trained and run entirely on the person who's using your application's hardware. Um, it's a really, really great tool for a hackathon like this. Uh, you don't have to get anything deep set up to, to make it work. All right, uh, the last thing before I demo is kind of the way that all of the pieces came together. Um, we wrote this thing called an engine to tie together all the parts. Cause you might imagine PoseNet gives us some output and then we wanna add things like drawings and sounds. Um, and all of that has to kind of come together into one cohesive thing. So let's imagine we wanted to animate fire. Um, you might imagine that PoseNet would output some key points like I just showed you. And then we would take P5 and we would use those key points to draw on the screen where those key points are. And finally, we would also add in some sound. And all of that we would sort of package together and put on the screen. Um, so why don't I just show you what that looks like before we hop into the Q&A. Um, so you should still be able to see my screen. Um, one second. Okay. Uh, can you all still see my screen? Can you see PoseNet here? Okay, people are saying yes, amazing. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, have to turn off my video on Zoom because one funky thing that is, uh, I think only one app can use your camera at a time. So temporary goodbye while I turn off my camera here.
Okay, and now I am going to turn on my camera here on Chrome. Okay. Um, let's see. So now my camera should be on. I see from the little red dot on the browser and I'm gonna hit start. Um, actually quickly before I hit start, I'll open the instructions pane. So I here have just some instructions really quick if you wanna see. So click the start button, choose your effects, adjust sound settings. Um, big note here for number four, stand in front of the camera so your body is visible. Remember I noted Posen is not intelligent like you and me. It is just the product of its examples. And unfortunately its examples don't include identifying body parts when I'm this close to the camera. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. So here's me again. That's why I said temporary goodbye. I'm back on camera. So let's see what my available effects are. I have some here. Um, and again, these effects are made with P5, but they're going to be put on the screen with the knowledge that PoseNet from ML5 gives us. So why don't we start with clap to make fire? So I'm gonna have to back up to make sure I can get my whole body and I'm gonna clap. All right. <laughs> So that one um, worked okay, I guess. Um, so you can see like it was moving around with my hands a bit. Um, why don't I show you clap to make lightning? Um, so again, the more of my body in here, the better pose that's gonna work. So I'm gonna try to back up a little more and let's see how this one looks. So this one's also going to look for my hands coming together. And you can see here that the um, effect continues to follow my hands, but it's not really following my hands because if my hands go away or my hands go to the side, it's sort of not fully following them. Again, that's because Posenet doesn't have hands in its key points. So this is kind of an estimate of where my hands are based on the wrist key point, but I really like this one. Um, cool, so that one worked pretty well. Um, and let's try the last one, which is raising your hands to make sparkles. So, whoa, okay. So let me go back to my presentation and turn my video back on. So did anyone have any questions or wanna see that again? Feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, but in general, yeah, I hope that made sense. So PoseNet was sort of detecting where my hands were and where my body was, and it was sending that information to P5 um, or to me. And I was using P5 to make the decision on how the drawing should look. And so that might be reminiscent of a Snapchat filter. Um, I think Snapchat definitely has some amazing, amazing tech going on because you can see from just this that they must have a lot more sort of like fine detection of even the parts of an eye or the individual parts of um, one's hair because they have a lot of cool stuff that interacts with all that. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Wesley says, this is impressive. If this is developed more, it can be used in VFX, like visual effects. Yes, Wesley, the cool thing is that I think the... Um, most advanced sort of studios in the world are using like really advanced versions of this exact stuff. Um, you might see like in a lot of movies where there's a really odd looking character that people are sort of dressed in these weird body suits. Maybe they have body suits have markers on them. That's because I think these technology companies, these movie companies are using technology like this to um, add effects to those weird characters or create um, or even generate entire landscapes for their um, movies. Yeah, so that's that's a really great point. And I think it's also another thing that um, could be really exciting when we start doing more like AR. You can imagine AR right now um, uses uh, object detection and computer vision. Um, and it'd be really cool to kind of integrate more and more advanced versions of that to create even more and more um, immersive and cool augmented experiences. Um, okay, so um, I'm happy to do Q&A now. So please pop all your questions out in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, 
I did answer some of them as we went, but maybe I'll do, I'll, I'll get one of the things set up right now, which is someone wanted the ML5 library. So why don't I pull that and put the answer in here. Yeah, so I think that should now be available to you guys. Um, and again, since you're gonna do your hackathon soon, I think it'd be super cool for you to, to see that um, in action. Um, if people are still thinking of questions, I can also go to the GitHub for this. Um, so why don't I go check that out? Oh, okay, one question here. What was the model used to train PoseNet or is it called PoseNet itself? That's a good question. So I think PoseNet is um, like originally something trained by a company or like group called TensorFlow. And you should be able to find a lot of information on how they trained it on their website. Um, I think one of the general underlying technologies is this idea of a convolutional neural network. Um, it uses a series of computations to identify patterns. Um, those computations are often called like convolutions and um, that all came together to create POSENT and, and similar models. Um, but definitely check out TensorFlow's website. I think they have a ton of information on how they trained it. Um, another question was, how did I get the data set to train my network or was it pre-trained? Great question. So in case someone doesn't know, training a network means you have um, a architecture of some sort, a mathematical architecture that you're gonna pass some data through to sort of train um, the model to perform a certain way, to in more detailed terms, tune the weights of a given model to output certain results. Um, and, and the question here is like, where is my data that I used to train my network or was it pre-trained? It was pre-trained. So that's the cool thing about ML5 is it's all pre-trained. You guys are going into a hackathon where you have limited time. It's always a fun idea to maybe make your own model from scratch. I think that's a great sort of longer term project. I don't know if it's realistic for a weekend, which is why I love to tell you guys about ML5. Everything's pre-trained. Everything runs sort of on the client side. You don't even have to create your own, um, you know, data storage or your own servers, you just have something that works right out of the box. Um, let's see. Also, people are asking for a Git repo or notebook. Exactly, exactly. I do have that. Let me pull it up really quick so I can send that to you guys. Also, I saw in the chat, Hamza asked, um, in video games, the actor wears a suit with lots of tracking dots and is implemented into the game with facial movements and more. Yes, it's exactly like PoseNet and much more advanced, exactly, exactly. So um, you saw PoseNet's key points included sort of a limited set of things. It had, you know, wrists, but no hands. It had eyes, but no nose, that, right? There's obviously models that have been trained to have everything. And there's also models that perhaps work more specifically on things that are easy to track, like a suit with tracking dots, right? So you can imagine that um, it's hard to make a model that works on everyone because people might have different clothes, different body shapes. Um, you might imagine that some of these studios have models that are optimized for things like a suit with tracking dots. Um, okay, so let me get that um, GitHub for you guys really fast. I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a second. Um, but I also see some more questions. So I'm gonna, I'm actually not sure how to use the q and I'm just gonna hit answer live for the ones I've already answered and see if that works. Um, okay, good, got it. This way I can sort of clean up the questions that are uh, there. Um, do, do, do. Okay, so let's see. Um, So one question is what led me to AI or neuroscience? So I'll be honest, I've liked neuroscience for a long time. I wasn't always sure if I wanted it to be like a career or something like that. But over time, I've just been super, super interested in continuing to look at the brain. Um, it's just so interesting to answer the question of what is this organ that gives us this amazing ability to think and to interact with the world, to see the world, smell the world, you know, understand the world. Um, and so for me, it's just something I keep coming back to. It's something that I find so, so, so fascinating. Um, and now that I'm more interested in AI, I also see the interplay there of, you know, the more we understand how we think, 
the more we can try to create systems that do the same thing. Um, sometimes that by creating a system that does something smart, we also gain insight, we gain a hypothesis about how we might be achieving that. So that's why I am so interested in that. Another thing is, um, you know, with AI revolutionizing basically every field, I feel like it's something that I can't not be interested in. Um, I feel like every single week I see a new exciting development that keeps me interested in that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna send in the chat. I hope you can all see the chat, um, the link to the GitHub. So this GitHub is, is uh, under one of my collaborators' GitHub accounts, Dan. And you can see in there everything that went into the project. It has our web code. It has like our basic HTML page. It has our implementation that uses PoseNet mixed in with our engine that sort of combines the PoseNet parts with the uh, P5 and the sound that we that I showed you earlier. Um, that all comes together for what we made. And so, yeah, feel free to fork it. Feel free to download it and try running it. Um, I'll definitely keep an eye on the repo. If any of you have questions about it, you can file um, like a PR or open an issue and I'll keep an eye to see if any of those are there. Um, okay, so more questions in the chat. Um, what are some events or projects that we do at AI at MIT? Um, so actually what I talked about today is just one part of AI at MIT. Uh, is the link not working? Uh, Wesley, I think the link I clicked on opens at least in incognito, which means it's not private. So definitely, um, maybe you have to click the word view code. Once it opens, try command F and look the words view code. Okay, but anyway, let me continue talking about the club. So what I described is actually one part of the club called labs at MIT. Um, oh, I, I sorry, I didn't send the link to everyone. You, you guys are so right, sorry about that. Here's the link, thank you. Yeah, I accidentally sent it to just uh, panelists. Sorry about that. Um, okay, finally I'll answer the question. Um, so what we do in the thing I described is we make projects, right? But there are three other components of AI at MIT and I think they are equally valuable and exciting. One is called reading group. Now as high schoolers, you may not be reading academic literature, in fact, I was not really doing that at all. So if you are, kudos. But um, what they do in that group is they read literature published by researchers. These are journal papers. These are very technical papers. And they try to break them down and help each other understand what are these papers saying? What are they doing? And what ideas can this give us for our own work? So that's really exciting. That's sort of a learning group. Another part of the club is similarly a learning focused group called workshops. Um, all of this stuff, by the way, you can learn more about here at this website. I just put it in the chat. Um, and this workshops group, I think also their stuff is available publicly on GitHub. They have tons and tons of notebooks of, someone mentioned the term notebook earlier. If you don't know what that is, it's a really easy sort of way to organize your code. They have tons of notebooks that go over um, different types of architectures of neural networks and let you sort of play around with them. Um, and I think they also, when you're in person, which I don't think you guys can do sadly, when you're in person here at the club, they will also sort of walk you through them and help you debug any, any you know, roadblocks you run into. Um, and the last part of, MI, of the AI club is this thing called Generator. And it's a competition that we run every year where people will submit really exciting, cool projects and uh, get judged on them after about a couple months of work. Um, so those are all really, really fun. My focus within the club is the thing I described to you, it's called AIM Labs or AI at MIT Labs, and we, and we focus on making projects. So you can see why I'd love to come talk to you guys as you're preparing for a hackathon. It's kind of my favorite thing. Um, let's see, more questions. Um, what is the learning curve for a beginner for ML5? I would say the learning curve is not too steep, depending on how comfortable you are with JavaScript. So JavaScript is a language, a programming language, that is one of sort of the three main components of most web applications. Um, to use ML5 well, you'd have to be comfortable playing around with JavaScript. I don't mean you have to be good at JavaScript, you have to be comfortable getting in there. If you have some bugs, you have to be comfortable getting in there and trying to solve those bugs. Um, so maybe if you wanna use ML5 and you've never touched JavaScript, I would spend one hour on a YouTube tutorial 
or other tutorial learning kind of what is JavaScript? How do you make things run in JavaScript? And then I would hop into ML5. What's really, really cool about ML5 though is I don't think you need to know anything about ML or AI to get your models working. Um, there's also this amazing YouTube channel, which I'm gonna link for you guys, called The Coding Train. And they have tons of examples using ML5. Um, so I hope that link works. They have, you can look, you can search on their page, tons and tons of videos where they use an ML5 model to make something cool. So if you really wanted to, um, you could just copy some of their videos to get something working. Um, I think a really cool part about any project, and this includes hackathons, is not so much making something that is groundbreaking, right? Like what I made is not groundbreaking. You have Snapchat, you probably have Snapchat, but it is something that helps you be creative. It is something that helps you learn. And it's something that helps you feel more, you know, connected to and more um, involved with modern technology. So if you feel like, you know, ML5 might be this huge step forward for you with ML, even though it doesn't require, you know, deeply understanding it, I think that's really great. And I think it'd be cool for you to pick something that like you think is cool that's out in the world and try to recreate it with ML5. Um, so let's see, what IDE do you recommend for ML5? Um, let's see. Um, so IDE is super um, up to you. For those who don't know, an IDE stands for an integrated development environment. It just refers to the app you're using or the sort of environment, because it might not be just one app, but the apps you're using to write your code. Um, I would recommend that you Google um, basic web development setup. And then after that, include the name of your device. So if it's a Mac, write Mac. If it's Windows, write Windows and see what it has to say. Because I think each device may have slightly different things that will make it work best. I personally will run my web app in Chrome. I will be developing using the Chrome console. So the console in Chrome will tell me when I have JavaScript bugs and I'll be writing my code in VS Code. VS Code is available, I think, across almost all devices. Um, so those are some resources that might be good for you, but I'm sure Google can help you out. One thing I've learned about being a computer science student at MIT is everyone Googles everything. There is no person who just like magically knows everything about how to make a website or how to um, build anything that requires code, just like off the top of their head. So if you have a question, um, always good to ask each other. Always good to ask people in your community or mentors you have, but just know that like Googling it is always the right answer as well. Um, okay. We still have a few more minutes, so I'm happy to answer any more questions. Or if you want to see more demos of um, the project I showed you, I can. Um, or if you want to brainstorm stuff for your hackathon, we can do that. Oh, Adelio asks, how long did that project take to develop? What a great question. So here's how the structure of the club looks. We get a group of people together and then they have eight weeks to put something together and then we demo it to the wider MIT community. So this is sort of hard to answer just because I don't remember exactly how many hours per week we spent, but I would estimate combined between me, Dan, and Sonia, who are the three members of my team, um, I would estimate between all of us, we might've spent up to eight hours a week. But you have to remember, we were also kind of busy with school and stuff like that. So that might not be an accurate estimate. Um, I would say if I had to make that project again, now that I've learned all the parts, right? Now that I know how to make a website, now that I know how to use ML5, I would say that I could probably put that project together in two days by myself, very much faster if I had some help or if I was working with Dan and Sonia again. Um, but I think you could also make something really similar, like a webcam-based thing with an ML5 part plugged in in like one day. I think you could definitely do that. I don't know how um, 
that would be conditional on like, you know, how comfortable you are with putting together like a basic website, like writing on index.html page, adding a little bit of style to that with CSS, and then plugging in the JavaScript needed for ML5. Um, one question is, will I be mentoring at the hackathon? No, I will not be mentoring at the hackathon, but um, I know tons of people who are, and they're all awesome. So I hope that you guys really get some good help with that. Um, I have experience creating standalone neural networks, but I've never implemented any network into usable products. Okay, great question. This question is about how are neural networks deployed into the real world, into actual software? Guess what? This is sometimes more complicated and sometimes takes more time than actually training and making a network because it's so different depending on each and every application. So you might know like um, your face ID on your phone, right? Like that's like something that works super well. It's sort of like really low power. Like it doesn't take anything crazy to make work. There are some other things that are like image-based recognition, but that would like basically require like so, 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 so many computers to run. And that would require like so much money and energy to keep running. So um, it you can see like there's a great, there's a huge range in between those two examples, right? So it's hard to answer this question with like a one, two, three formula because it's just so diverse depending on what the algorithm is, what the application is, how many users there are, right? So my app, the one I just showed you, PoseNet, because I'm using ML5, because all of the AI is already trained, there's no sort of like updated training happening real time, because all of the code is running on the client side, meaning it's running on the person who's opening the app's computer, right? If nothing is running on my computer, when you go to my, when you go to my app, because of all those factors, um, it was so easy to deploy, but let's change the, let's change the game a bit. Let's say I was running the code. I might have a limit on how many people can use it at, at once, right? Cause there's a limit to how many computations and how many web calls, like a given structure infrastructure can handle. Um, so really great question. I think it's something that every single group and every single person making a tool struggles with um, that question of how do you actually implement a um, machine learning tool into the world? It's a huge, huge question. Um, but yeah, I guess if I had to give a sort of general answer, there's going to be a server somewhere that's running the code and that server is going to be interacting over the internet with people who are um, making requests or sending information back to that server. Sorry, it's a little nebulous, but it was a really good question. Um, another question is, any tips on how to make the best of what we learn in the learnathons and hackathons? And a related question, what recommendations do you have for people who are completely new to hackathons? So again, I don't think that the point of a hackathon or the point of any project, unless you know maybe it's your job or like you're you know done with school, I don't think the point is to have a groundbreaking tool. I think the point is to make something that is creative, that makes you happy and that makes you learn. So my tip on how to make the best of this hackathon is anything that interests you, write it down. Keep a list of things that are interesting to you because you can go dive into them later more deeply. There's a limit to how much you can learn in just one weekend. So write down anything you see that's cool, dive into it more later. Another thing is don't be afraid to get confused. There are some things that have taken me months to wrap my head around. If I gave up the first time I heard about it and got confused, I would have learn nothing, right? So you're going to see tons of new things at these learnathons and hackathons. Give it time. If it's interesting to you, but you don't get it, give it time. Um, and then the last thing is, again, make stuff that you think is cool. It doesn't matter if when you Google it, you see five other products that do the same thing. It's still a learning experience for you, so give it a shot. All right. Um, another question is, do you have any advice for first-time hackathon participants or people new to coding projects in a set time frame? Yes. Here's my tip for you. This really frustrated me with hackathons the first time I did it. But when you're at a hackathon, because the whole thing comes to an end at a certain point, you do have to have sort of a minimum viable product. Meaning, let's say your end goal is this amazing, cool idea. Don't give up on that. Save that idea. Write it down. You're going to achieve it someday. But just for the time being, for the hackathon, define what is called a minimum viable product, an MVP, and try to get that done. So like, for example, if I were to remake my project, the minimum viable product might be have a webcam that turns on, because that wasn't easy, actually, and then have PoseNet output 
where my hand is. That's it. I know that doesn't sound cool, but guess what? That's a base to move on and make something cool next. So kind of define for yourself a minimum viable product so that at the end of the day, you know, maybe you don't achieve your grand vision, but you're a step closer to it and you have something to be proud of and you have something to explain to a judge or to a friend who asks, what did you do? You're like, okay, my goal was this big idea at the hackathon. I had 24 hours. So I made this and here it is. Um, so that's my main advice to you. Don't get frustrated. You're not going to achieve like a million things in like one day. No one ever does, but set that MVP. All right. Um, another question is what exactly is a hackathon? This is my first one. So a hackathon is an opportunity to build something. This could mean that you spend the whole time coding something up. This could mean that you design something that you plan to code up later. This could mean that you research a topic that you want to build something for later, but you don't even know what to build yet. So you're just spending that time researching. You know, the people who win hackathons are the people who have probably done one before. I, I would say that like, there is probably a recipe for winning, but I'm not here to talk about that. Because as I said, I think the point is that you learn something and you make something you're proud of, and that isn't necessarily what's gonna win. So, um, just pick something that makes you feel like you're going to be proud at the end of 24 hours and put in some work. Try making something. And again, if you get confused, don't give up. And if you um, learn something new, I think you've done it right. Um, and then do you have any advice for high school freshmen who wants to get into MIT? Yes. My advice is always pursue your passions and try new things. So you're all on the right track by doing this hackathon. Um, you know, uh, applying to any college is trying to make the point that you are someone who is going to contribute to that college community. You are a learner and you are someone who, you know, cares about advancing society in some kind of, you know, tangible way. So this is a great chance to try doing any of those things. Try learning, try building something that's useful to people and helpful to people um, and gain experience being a collaborator and being part of a community. All right, I think we're getting to the end of our time, but you all had some you know, really amazing questions and I look forward to seeing what you're gonna make um, this weekend. Um, thank you so much. All right, thank you so much for speaking, Kathleen. It's been amazing to hear and see all the cool projects that you've done and you left some really, really nice words for the, the very aspiring high schoolers. So thank you so much for coming. Yeah, and thank you all so much for coming as well. It was great speaking to you all. And yeah, good luck. Yeah, good luck, everyone.